No, thank you. I should have told ChatGPT to have like a word limit in my bio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, I was asked to do kind of a little bit of a sharing on, on, on Citrus's journey um, with, with our packaging and cooling sort of story. Um, so to give you some background, we, we, have, a, we have something called the, the FMS system, um, and, and basically, <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated story, but, but the EU wanted some sort of regulation or control mechanism in place to control FCM, false codling moth, um, when it arrives there. And, and really cold treatments um, were not viable for us. Just commercially, we didn't have facilities, and um, damage-wise, it wasn't possible. It was just a no-go. And, and really, it was probably 45% of our market at the time. Um, so we put in place sort of the self-regulatory system where we ensure... Um, that the FCM is being eradicated before it arrives at, at, their, at their side. And it's a pretty complicated system. Um, it all relies sort of on, on a consecutive step kind of approach. But yeah, there's things happening in production, harvest, handling, um, there's inspection processes, certification. Um, but really what's happening from our perspective is, is the in-transit cooling side. So when the fruit get into the container, um, th that's, that's kind of what, what influenced all this work. Um, so yeah, we followed kind of three strategies. Um, the first one is just to improve container cooling. Um, and, and basically the premise is that um, temperatures or time over low temperature storage um, kills FCM moths, uh, or the larva and the fruit at least. Um, unfortunately, chilling injury is also induced over time at low temperatures in storage. Um, so yeah, it was good for FMS, but bad for us. And the trick then is just to kind of find this optimization point or this, this perfect spot in, in the container um, to not induce chilling injury, but to kill um, the moth itself. Um, so, so we have a sort of a little diagram here, and it illustrates it. If you get the copy of the slides, you can take a look. But yeah, this is just kind of showing this green zone where you, where you go into um, sort of decay problems or chilling injury problems or visual brine disorders, or you just don't have sufficiency in killing um, the pest. Okay, yeah, so as I said, the first strategy was container cooling. Um, and basically that entailed just modeling the whole container and, and fully understanding what, what the issue there was. Um, the benefit of, of really utilizing the container perfectly or as optimally as you can um, is basically you're, you're delivering a certain set point at the refrigeration unit. Um, let's say it's, it's two degrees Celsius. Um, but on the other side of the container near the doors, you're probably getting a little bit warmer, sometimes quite a lot warmer. Um, so. Maybe this is sufficient to kill your insects, but it's probably causing chilling injury. If you drop the temperature so that this side is sufficient to kill the insects, you're then um, doing a good job here, but hurting your fruit on this side. And, and really what we want is a fully uniform um, cooling process in the container itself. Um, yeah, just to give you some stats from our models, and which are quite well validated, as you can see on the top. Um, the flow rates in the pallets at the unit are probably sitting at about, like, let's say, 10 centimeters per second, so just moving upwards through the pallets. Um, but at the door, they're running at about one centimeter to one millimeter a second. That's incredibly slow. Um, so you can imagine if that fruit is a bit warm, then, then really probably conduction is moving a lot faster. Um, but basically, the air just heats up immediately from the fruit if it's a little bit warm and then, and then does nothing until it leaves. Um, so two strategies to solve this. The first is um, container flow optimization kits, um, and the second one is high porosity packaging. So f to sort of optimize the container, we, we really ran a lot of different strategies of like boards and all sorts of things to, to redistribute how the airflow is moving into the container. Um, there's some of the examples that we, we tried in the simulation. Um, what we found immediately actually was that void plugs, which you guys are already using, and we were also using are actually really effective. Um, so if you have a set point of two um, and you have a good void plug, you're probably gonna get like, let's say, let's say two and a half degrees Celsius in your warmer areas. Um, if you remove that void plug, you can get up to three degrees higher. So like almost five degrees Celsius. Um, and the reason is just because your airflow bypasses right through the pallets, it goes around and it's out. Um, so really a fantastic tool, but, but unfortunately maybe and not actually be implemented well. So we know it's being done, but, but people often don't install it correctly. So they leave maybe the, the pallet base open or it's too floppy and it kind of comes open from a bit of airflow. Um, so its installation um, process is actually really, really critical and, and completely, well, the PPCB is monitoring it, but um, I, I don't think they often know how important it is, especially at the inspector level. 
Um, yeah, from our side, obviously we, we have a scale problem. Um, citrus is, is 160 million cartons, um, and it's really just a high turnover process often, especially for the oranges. And there was a low capacity for a very complicated system in a container. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a high, what, what do you call it? Um, yeah, it's, I guess it's almost a low, low, prof, low profit, um, high, high volume kind of process. So to spend a lot of money and a lot of time and energy on installing a complicated kit would be, would be too much. So two strategies, we use sort of pallet spacers. Let me just jump to that slide. Um, and, and basically the premise here is, y yes, your airflow is not so great at the refrigeration, sorry, at the door side, um, but really where the heat is coming in is actually from the walls and door. Um, and, and probably the biggest issue is actually the walls on the side. So if you can just move the pallets away a little bit from the wall, um, even that slow airflow rate will just remove that heat coming in and then it will just take it out. Um, so basically just a little corner piece actually, we just sort of stuck into another corner piece that was already there and it just was flexible enough to allow, load, allow loading, um, but the pallet can just slide in and then there is a little bit of space. Uh, and that, that worked extraordinarily well. Um, but I think it looked a little bit too MacGyver, um, so it, it just didn't take off. I think it might take off later. There was also concerns if, if China, uh, which is a steering market, took it, they might see it as some sort of manipulation. And then there's often a lot of miscommunication between these markets. Um, and explaining these concepts will probably not go down well. Um, so yeah, it, like I said, it looked too MacGyver. The other one was, was what we call the T floor, because it looks like a T. Um, and the idea here was really the smallest piece of sheet that you could put in, it's easy to put in, it's low cost, um, and, and we kind of made it open source, so it's not patented, anybody can use it. Um, and yeah, basically it's, it's just sort of a, a T-shaped device, a little bit, what we saw in the simulations and a little bit in experiment is a large recirculation zone, and even some of the airflow um, being pulled in from the unit and sort of doing weird stuff at, at this side. And basically they're just, just high airflow rates, which is bad for Ryan conditions, um, and, and then, yeah, just excessive cooling. So it, it allows some of the airflow momentum to push forward um, down towards the door. Um, and then a lot of airflow is also escaping in that gap between the two pallets because they always side shift into the, into the walls. Um, so this little T section just gives, gives you a little bit of protection so that high velocity airflow doesn't do, yeah, doesn't just do a, a little escape route. Um, and yeah, we, we saw really good results um, from this, this device as well. And um, I, mean, I think at the workshops, I've really been selling it to the guys just to say, um, you know, I, th I think the marketing guys, if they have a product, they'll come in with really fancy animations and I'll do a lot of stuff. Um, and I said to them, we're not doing any marketing, um, so maybe that makes it look less valuable. Um, and and that, that explanation seems to have worked. So a lot of people have tried to adopt it this year, and I think next year we'll, we'll get some really large scale data to see if it's working as well as we think it is, or it should. Yes, the other strategy, improving packaging. Um, yeah, we developed sort of a new way to, to measure a pallet's resistance to airflow, because obviously um, the higher the resistance to airflow, or like the more dense it is, um, the more likely the airflow is to take another route and just sort of bypass. Um, so we, we just called it ohms, because that, that's sort of the Greek symbol, um, and it does actually match sort of um, the electrical ohms law, but it's a little bit different. This is the ventilation law. So they often use it in mining schemes. Um, to calculate how airflow is just distributed into, into vents. Um, but yeah, a good value for a pallet at the moment is, is 2,000. That's, that's what we calculated from the simulation. So we've got a pallet with a 2,000 ohm vertical resistance, um, you're going to be okay. Just for some sort of context, um, we tested, we did thousands of tests with a wind tunnel, um, and we saw that the pallet base, for example, because really in series you can actually add these, these um, resistances up, um, so a, pal a pallet is in series, it's at the bottom, and it's contributing about, let's say, 250, um, so maybe 10% of the total resistance. And it really didn't seem to matter which pallet base we used, as long as there was some good sort of slat spaces um, in, in the system. So if it was completely blocked off, then, it, then it's a bit of a disaster. Um, but yeah, we didn't see a, a huge need to improve the pallet base. It seemed to be more important to tackle the carton. Um, and then for the carton, the, the, the growers, exporters, everybody was really under high pressure from the FMS and all these changes. Um, so their basic de desire was just as small a change as possible. Um, so what we did was we, we used the, the A15C carton, and that represents about 50% of exports. Um, it's, it's basically the bulk, um, also high volume carton that costs very little, um, just because everybody's running it as fast as they can with as few changeovers as they can. 
um, and we made some modifications. The first thing we did, um, we took these ventiles and we moved them a little bit out um, towards the corners, and that just allowed it to, I think I have a picture just now, um, to actually just line up when everything is, is stacked. Um, and then we added some holes on the top as well, which also align during stacking. Yeah, important to say this. Um, yeah, so th this kind of research was happening maybe 2020, 2021. And um, then we got news that we will probably have to drop our set point temperature in 2022 by one degree Celsius. So we will lose four EU fruit, um, FMS. Um, our two degrees Celsius will have to drop to one. Um, and we, we pitched the idea that maybe we can use this carton if it's cooling well enough, and it was. Um, if you use this carton, then you will get that one degree benefit anyway, so then you can use two. And if you're not using this carton, um, then you will have to use one of the one degree Celsius um, yeah, packaging devices. So yeah, that worked extremely well, and I will go into sort of like the results and, and how we approached it. Um, but yeah, at the moment, if you use an A15CS2 carton, you can still utilize a two degree Celsius, which um, yeah, it's been tricky because, because of all the FMS changes now, our supply chain or cold chain has actually extended almost two weeks. Um, so what, what has happened now is, is people are still getting chilling injury, um, but they're not seeing the benefit of the carton directly. So um, it's really important that we try and show the research of the carton and its outputs um, to all the, all the growers, exporters, and, and to show the benefit. But it's really difficult to interpret when you're on the ground um, just getting claims or whatever. OK, um, yeah, just again to that Ohm's analysis or, or perspective. Um, the old carton was sort of sitting at about 4,800, um, and the new one is sitting at 2,000, where we wanted it. The next ones to optimize are actually the open tops, which are sitting much, much higher, um, like four or five times higher in resistance. And that's just because of securing sheets and, and all these things. Um, so we are working on that, and I think we've actually solved it. So we will probably um, provide something less disruptive um, probably in the next year or so. Okay, just looking at the, how, how kind of approach the ventile positioning, um, what we found for the A15C and actually all the cartons is that if you, if you kind of work on a 100 mil grid, grid across the whole carton, um, when these things sort of rotate in the line, um, they always sort of, if you put your vents here, they will always align with each other, no matter what you do. So really, the, the carton designs itself. Um, so this in the red is showing from the top um, where the pallet is cross-stacked, so two, two layers are touching each other. Um, and this is resulting in about 1% open area. Um, and then for the new carton, um, we're getting about 6% open area. And really, you can see, I mean, it's a massive amount of, of volume or yeah, open space for the air to penetrate. Um, many requests, please can, I'll tell you why now. Um, please can we move some of the vents and just shift them? Um, but unfortunately, if you just move some, even just this little bit, your, your, your porosity just drops dramatically. And then you only have about 4%. And the relationship between open area and, and resistance is not linear. So you, you actually, yeah, there's a certain point at about 5 6% where your resistance is rockets. Um, so it really is just not viable. Um, just to illustrate the old carton, so you can see the ventiles were not in alignment, um, and the new one is. OK, and then just looking at our trial, how we approached and evaluated it. So we did, obviously, simulations and um, yeah, just, just kind of analyzed as much as we could in the office. Um, and then on the commercial side, we, we took about 60 containers um, and we printed or manufactured about 150,000 cartons and we let them run on a chem-free line. Um, just chem-free because then they were isolated in the containers. Um, they can't be mixed with other stuff. Um, and yeah, that, that, that really resulted in some very nice results. So there's a picture of the pallets arriving on that end. Um, really in good condition, no chilling injury. Um, so sort of a sample of the results. Um, but yeah, like it was about one degree cooler in general. Um, so functioning very well. What we saw is sometimes containers just do well, even when they got the wrong packaging. Um, you've probably seen that as well. But um, when, when you get a container that's performing badly, it, if you have one of these S2s, there's far less likely to perform badly. Um, that, that's our explanation. OK. Um, yeah, chilling injury. I think I need to share a bit about that already. But yeah, the, the general consensus, just because the carton is allowing um, the air to propagate more easily through the pallets, um, you get less chilling injury because it's not just circulating at the, at the refrigeration unit um, and just blasting one area. It's, it's, really, it's really getting out there. Okay, and then just communication-wise, um, how, we, how we spoke about this to the industry because it was a really a shock. Um, some people like me and now some people hate me. Um, but, but it wasn't actually me that did it. It was, it was really a, a long process of, of people. 
Um, so of course, research on our side was done. Um, and then we proposed this thing. We have all these boards with, with representatives from the industry. Um, they reviewed it. Um, and then finally, and, and possibly too late, but it was, it was a six month sort of process, um, we started throwing this out to all the manufacturers. And, and that's when things get scary, because those guys, um, they're running on very tight margins. And uh, yeah, you know, often they're owned by growers and all these things. Um, but yeah, they, they kind of saved the day and, and they made it work. But yeah, all together, everything kind of worked out um, and a lot of diligence. And then, yeah, I think pretty impressively six months from maybe September um, until the, the next year, we had the cotton running full on. The problem here, maybe I should have mentioned, is also that you, you cannot just do some of the cottons with this new design um, because they cannot switch over the plates fast enough and, and they lose profitab profitability. Um, so it was an all or nothing shift to every other market as well. Okay, and then challenges. Yeah, there were actually challenges. There were many. Um, although the carton's stronger, because those ventiles moved a little bit to the corners, we got about a 5% increase in strength, um, and they cooled better. Um, and the cooling better is actually really beneficial at the cold store level, just because of the new FMS regulations, which require far more pre-cooling, um, so we can actually get higher turnouts. Um, the one big issue was gluing. Um, we didn't pick it up in those 150,000 cartons. Um, and basically the issue is just this, this ventil on this one, which, as I said, we cannot move. Um, and, and actually the lid actually also got a little bit smaller. N not from our design, but, but yeah, it happened in the process. Um, but yeah, this little gap now is needed for gluing. And you've got to get your little cotton assembly machine to squirt glue, glue on this little edge. And it really takes a lot of refining. Um, so we have some plans to, to improve that. Um, I don't know how, how much capacity or, or interest people have now for a change in the carton again, but probably it will be a gradual introduction, not, not a shock as we did before. Um, but yeah, we, we, have, we have some solutions. But yeah, there's always some unforeseen um, issue that causes a lot of headaches. But I think the, the wins far outweighed the, outweighed the losses. And then yeah, our third strategy um, is just monitoring. And this was a big data approach. Um, basically for every EU container we shipped out, and there's like, let's say 30,000 a year, um, we put a cell phone temperature logger in it. Um, and basically, uh, here's sort of how we put it in. It, it's moved around a little bit gradually, but, but basically one pallet in, inside the wall at the USDA 3 position, um, at least for the citrus one. Um, and yeah, this data, unfortunately because it's in the pallet and it needs to be for, for various other reasons, just because we understand that temperature in relation to all the others, um, it, it, it doesn't always send its data out immediately, but when the container arrives and it's opened, that data gets transmitted. Um, we set up sort of a database system um, via eCert, so all this data gets sent to them via the, um, the vendors. Um, and then, yeah, we do a whole lot of, um, let me get to the right slide, I'm here. Um, we do a whole lot of data analysis, we clean it. It's really quite tricky because sometimes the things start very early, sometimes they end very late. Um, and to interpret it correctly, you, you need to know the start and finish. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of work, but, but what the big value is that we get to have all this data and then make really good educated guesses of how to move next. Um, and then we also use it to just to validate our decisions. Um, so is it actually working? And then we can always backtrack um, or just show, show the growers, exporters um, that the system is working well. As it turns out, it has worked quite well. Um, we have good, good data now for the A15C. And then just a quick one. Um, we're taking sort of this data approach a lot further now. Um, over the process, we've really collected a lot of data from, from other sort of components of the supply chain. And then, of course, we have this container data. Um, and we can make many assumptions about what temperature they were at and what conditions. Um, and one of the questions we were asking is, how, how long does it take this fruit to turn into this kind of fruit? Uh, obviously, those factors are, are related to handling age and condition, um, but we just consider humidity and temperature. I'm moving fast because this thing is orange now. Um, so I'll just, I'll just kind of run through the example. We have a quality model, um, and if you have sort of a temperature timeline from harvest till arrival at market, um, you can model its, its degradation in how, much, how many days of shelf life is remaining. So in this good scenario, um, you maybe start with 55 days, um, and then you end with 30 days when it's at market. And then in a bad example, which is very similar, um, you start with the same amount of shelf life days, um, but you have nothing when it arrives at market. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of use these, these plots. So for oranges, lemons, soft citrus, and grapefruit, um, you can see we, we have sort of a distribution of, of how many days left each fruit has um, when it's at, at the pack house level, um, and then when it's at containerization point, and then at market. And you can really see 
um, why we're seeing sometimes issues and claims, um, especially in soft citrus, um, because of how their fruit were handled over the course of the supply chain. Um, so we're going to expand the system a little bit and, and just use it as a forecast kind of system um, to give better insight. And yeah, I have some conclusions, but they basically are what I said before. So I'll just land it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.